about midway through the month here and uh, got clouded out trying to watch the Perseid meteors uh, the last two days. I, I saw one in the daytime, actually. Uh, but uh, didn't get to see the, the display at night and everything, but uh, uh, still kind of interesting stuff. Just before we went to air, I was watching CNN, and they had this super card up there saying, Americans start to spend again, and it was listing all these little items like books and so forth that are showing an increase in 1.5 to 2.0% uh, in, in, in revenue from these specialized markets here. But that's not even up to the rate of inflation. And it's not reflecting that Americans are voluntarily choosing to spend more. It's basically a reflection of the rising prices on everything. The United States imports the vast majority of those products that are in the stores, and as the dollar continues to decline in value, those prices are going to go up. And that's just the way it is, sadly, here. And so, again, it's more propaganda. They're trying to uh, spin the idea that the economy is better because you're having to spend more on everything. It's always been your fault. You're not spending enough. In fact, I reprised an article from back in 2010 where the Federal Reserve said the only thing that's wrong with the economy is Americans are saving too much. They need to loot those savings accounts and go out on a spending binge, and the economy will light back up again, which, of course, did not transpire. Most Americans don't have any savings left. And more spending doesn't do any good, especially if it's being done on a credit card, which... Obviously, the Federal Reserve, is re- that's what they're really talking about. Spend on your credit cards. Borrow more money so we can create more currency and put it into circulation. Because the pyramid is collapsing here. Our phone lines are open, 800-313-9443, 800-313-9443. Overall, kind of a slow news day here, so call on and uh, share what you would like. Uh, the lovely Miss Crystal is in our control room, twiddling the dials, keeping us out of trouble. And ready to answer your calls when you call on in. Obviously, Syria continues to be very much up at the top of the news. Uh, The Syrian troops have overrun one more of these districts in Aleppo that were formerly under the control of the hired mercenary army. And uh, there's still uh, sporadic clashes around the place. But as far as a unified front for the rebel army, that appears to be gone. The uh, hired mercenaries have lost the initiative. And that means ultimately they're going to be (coughs) losing this war. Now, the Syrian... Envoy to Tehran, Hamad Hassan, said the reality is this is not a revolution. Syria is at war with Tel Aviv and Washington. That's what's really going on. Israel's not helping the matter by basically coming out and saying they have a plan for Syria, which is to turn it into the new Somalia. No central government, no central army, just a bunch of rival factions and warlords fighting each other and keeping the place in chaos which removes Syria uh, as a potential opposition for the war on Iran, which is what's going on. So at, at this point, Israel may be thinking they don't need to completely conquer Syria if they can just have it descend into complete and utter chaos, then it is uh, uh, effectively out of the game going into Iran. And of course, as we understand, uh, Israel is just all hot and bothered to get the war with Iran running. Uh, apparently in Damascus, government troops found a tunnel full of weapons underneath a house in Damascus. And most of the weapons were Israeli-made. Things like night vision, goggles, sophisticated telecommunications equipment, satellite transceiver, all that kind of thing here. So, uh, again, uh, this was never a, a, a revolution. This is an outside covert attempt at an overthrow by the United States and by Israel as part of their plan for Eretz Israel from the Nile to the Euphrates because the imaginary playmate in the clouds told our ancestors in their sheep paddocks 2,000 years ago that this was what was supposed to be the modern world. We're going to take a break for commercials. We'll be back after these words from our sponsor. Kansas, aloha. Jim, welcome to the show. What's on your mind today? Money. We go, yeah, it's like on all of our minds. Money, <laughs> how would you like to hear what money really is? Well, There's let's hear we, what, what your point of view is. Okay, take a silver certificate yep. and a dollar bill yep. and compare them. And you can pull up a silver certificate off the web. I, I actually have a few of them. The, read the writing on it. Yes. Okay? Anyhow, you look at a dollar bill and it says it's a Federal Reserve note. First of all, what is a note? A note is simply a promise to pay. But you go to the legal dictionary and look up a definition of a note, and you will find that it requires four things. Let's say I buy a car from you. 
We put down a piece of paper. We put, I will buy this car from you. So you've got the two pe- people involved exchanging the money. And I will pay you by a certain date, and I will pay you a certain amount. Those four things have to be on there, or it is not a note. Agreed? Well, I agree with you, but given that okay. all, all these Federal Reserve notes are loans from the private central bank into circulation, huh? then yes, that's between it. the bank and the customers and the people in governments who will borrow those notes, put them into circulation, let them circulate around, and then pay them back to the Federal Reserve, except the money to pay the interest doesn't exist unless you take out a new and larger loan. What I'm getting at, though, is why it's a loan, why it's, why it's really not money, okay? Because if, if that's true, if those four things have to be on a note, that Federal Reserve note is fraud in your face. Well, because the- it only has th- one of the four. It only has the amount on the corners. It doesn't say who's going to pay, who's going to be paid, and it doesn't say when. Now you take a civil certificate and read it. Read the writing on it. And it says right on there, this certifies that there is on deposit in the Treasury of the United States of America $1 in silver. Mm-hmm. That means they've got a dollar in silver to, to give you a dollar in paper, mm-hmm. the silver certificate. Okay? And then it's payable to the bearer. That's the guy that's going to be paid mm-hmm. on demand, and there's your due date, yes. and the amount's on the corners. That's a true note. That's a real promise to pay. Yes. And they had something to pay. Silver. Yes. Now, our present money has nothing to pay, so how can they make it a note? And yet they call it a note. Well, the whole Federal Reserve see the Act... Fraud? Yeah, I see the fraud, and I'm uh, absolutely in agreement with you. The whole Federal Reserve system is a fraud, Because these Federal Reserve notes are created and loaned into circulation, um, you know, in response to uh, banks borrowing, corporations borrowing, consumer borrowing, and, of course, the U.S. government, which prints up Treasury bonds to trade for Federal Reserve notes of equivalent value. And what backs up the Treasury bonds is the future slave labor of all the American taxpayers. The Treasury has printed up some of of those bonds. There aren't enough taxpayers to make good on them. That's why... There's actually a Treasury bond bubble right now. But in point of fact, go ahead. Let's look at what you just said in a different light, because you're saying it right. Yes. But if you go to a bank to borrow 100000 to build a house, does that bank have 100000 Most banks won't even have it. They won't have it in cash because they don't need it. But the banks that are dealing in drugs, they'll have it. But if they're not going to give you 100000 in cash. When you sign the note, the second you sign that note, the banker is then authorized to go to his computer, pull up your account, and put 100000 in digits in your checking account. Mm-hmm. And bango, you just created 100000 by borrowing it. That's exactly how the system works, except, of course, you're yes. not allowed to just no. create out of thin air 100000 to pay it back to the bank. You the must go is. out. You must go out, and you must do what somebody who has a bunch of those paper and ink certificates tell you to do in order to get the certificates to give back to the bank. That is the method of enslavement under a private central bank. Banks can just create the money as much as they want, but you must do what you are told by somebody who has a bunch of those paper notes in order to get the money banks, back. That's basically it, yes. Banks cannot create those, those digits, that digit money, until somebody borrows it. That's exactly Government, right. Industry or, or you. So if everybody quit borrowing tomorrow, guess what would happen? Well, everybody so has quit borrowing. The system would be dead because there'd be no new money. That's right. Well, see, it's a pyramid scheme because the way it works is uh, uh, each new generation of borrowers will borrow money and put it into circulation, and it will circulate through in salaries and purchases and all the rest of that until part of it is used to pay the interest on the old money. And as long as there is always a new and larger generation of borrowers, the system will kite forward. But they've run out of people. Everybody is in debt. Nobody wants to borrow. Let me finish my point, and then I'll let you talk a little bit more. And in order to stave off the collapse of this Ponzi scheme, this pyramid scheme, the U.S. government went on a borrowing binge on your behalf, without your permission, I might add, to try and continue to borrow more and more money to keep the pyramid going. Now that has run its course, and this is why everybody's saying it has to come apart. There is no 11th marble out there. And we can count on the governments and banks of the world to basically grab everything under the illusion that there's a debt that is, you know, owed by we the people, 
on behalf of the government, and they're going to grab everything and try and return us back to serfdom, where the land owns the people rather than the people owning the land. Well, look at it this way. In the old days, you'd go over to Africa, get a bunch of men, bring them over here and make them slaves. Yes. But they found out that was really too expensive. By the time you pay their, their hospitalization, their, their uh, rent... I there mean, wasn't their a lot of hospitalization. Food. They just threw the sick ones overboard. Ah, uh, sure. But the fact is, it was too damn expensive to own slaves. So, they had to have a new way to make slaves. And what's the best way in the world is to make a debtor the slave... Well, it's, it's, to, borrow, it's to trick us into in believing yep. that the debt is a real thing. That's how they made the slaves. We, uh-huh. have been, we have been taught to believe that debt is a real thing. It's rule by debt, and it is no more real than rule by divine right or rule by chattel ownership of our bodies. And as a civilization... It is, it is legal in one way, because if I, if I borrow from the bank, I've got to work. My labor pays that back. Well, that's, I, I, that's a debt we can all. That's a debt we all agree to. Okay. The problem is the vast majority of the debt that the American people are being forced to pay is debt not of their own making. Money borrowed to bail out Wall Street. Money borrowed to give to Israel. Money borrowed for weapons and war. Sure, that's government. Yeah. Government borrowing, and corporations when they borrow the same way, but that that, that creates the money. But the debtor is the slave. That's exactly so right. Done, they've taken us from an old method of slavery to a new method of slavery. Well, basically what it is in the American Revolution, we broke free of that kind of debt slavery because uh, it wasn't that new. The Bank of England did exactly the same system. The Currency Act passed by King George III ordered all the American colonies to conduct their commerce only using banknotes borrowed at interest from the Bank of England. And it it drove the colonies into the same mass poverty and unemployment that was typical of England uh, of that era. And it was that abuse of the currency and obvious enslavement of the people that created the anger that led to the revolution. Our schools don't teach that anymore, and they haven't taught it since 1913, because uh, a corrupt Congress and a corrupt president sold us right back into the same kind of debt slavery. And now we need to break free of it again. Exactly. But if you look at it in a simple form, in the old days, the slave was a physical thing. Today, it's a mental thing. That's it. Because when you borrow, you become the slave. And it's your labor that pays back the note and gets rid of those digits that they created when they originally loaned them to you. Okay, well, let me, let me make a, a very clear distinction here. When the United States was first formed and we'd gotten rid of the Bank of England, there were still banks because banks can serve a useful function in society. But banks were kept off to one side of the flow of uh, money inside the United States. The government would create the money and spend it into circulation to buy whatever it is the government needed, whether it was roads or buildings or, or whatever. The money would then circulate through society without accruing interest and then be taxed back at the end of the cycle to balance the books. Banks were off to one side. People had a choice whether or not they wanted to involve a bank in their lives. They had a choice whether or not they were going to put their money in the bank. They had a choice whether or not they were going to borrow from the bank. And as uh, the economy would tighten up, people would stop borrowing money. So the system was inherently a stable one and self-correcting. Then we came along with these private central banks, and basically the, the role changed where now the money creation authority that was vested in the government by the U.S. Constitution was transferred to a private central bank by the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. Now, I hold that that was unconstitutional to do because such a fundamental change to the structure of our Constitution should have required an amendment with three-quarters of the states ratifying, but that didn't happen. From that day on... Absolutely right. The banks create the money and loan it to the government that spends it into circulation, and as it circulates around paying salaries and buying goods and all the rest of it, it's accruing interest to that private central bank. So the government has to tax the people more to get that money back and pay back to the private central bank. And as a matter of fact, at this point, the federal government can't even make the interest payments, let alone ever, ever deal with the principal. And at that point, with the Federal Reserve Act, uh, banking 
uh, you, we lost our freedom to say no to the banks because just to engage in commerce in the United States with a Federal Reserve note, you are already involved in the bank's business. You're part of the bank's customer base because that money you're using doesn't belong to you. It is a loan from the private central bank. And we've seen more and more recently where the banks are trying to get rid of cash.